Hi, everyone. Today we've got Dr. K.Y. Srinivasan uh, here giving a talk on Linux Gex, Gex RDMA on Hyper-V. Um, K.Y. is a partner architect at Microsoft, focused on Linux-related kernel work. Um, prior to joining MSFT, he was a distinguished engineer at no Novel, where he worked on Zen, KVM, and a variety of other OS projects. Um, prior to Novell, KY was a uh, distinguished engineer at AT&T Bell Labs, where he was an architect for several releases of the Unix operating system. For further ado, floor to KY. Thank you very much. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. I would like to first thank the organizers for the fantastic arrangements here. Um, and also, I would like to thank all of you for taking the time to come and listen to me talk about what we're doing to extend the reach of Linux, if you will, onto various Microsoft platforms. Um, with that, here's the agenda for my talk today. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about uh, our Linux journey as it is. Talk a little bit about the Hyper-V architecture. And then before I get into the, the Linux RDMA performance, which is the crux of what I'm going to be talking about, I will spend a few minutes talking about uh, some basic principles of RDMA and to see how it gets mapped uh, into a guest uh, on Hyper-V. All right, I, I came here uh, this last Tuesday, and over the last several days, many people have asked me, what is a Microsoft guy doing at a Linux conference, right? So how many of you know that Microsoft does Linux? And how many of you know that we do Linux quite well? <laughs> Good. <laughs> well, th th this slide captures it all. Just about um, a year and a half ago or so, um, our current CEO uh, declared our love for Linux. Um, and they say love is in the air. For us, it's in the cloud, really. Uh, that's where uh, we are seeing a lot of traction for Linux-based workloads um, in our cloud infrastructure. So why do we do Linux in the cloud? Uh, it's simply because our customers want it. And they're loving what we are uh, supporting on our cloud infrastructure. And as you can see, almost 25% of all of the workloads currently running in public Azure, Azure is our cloud infrastructure, is all various versions of Linux. And in some geographies, maybe that number may be even higher if you go to Asia and other places. So <laughs> the, the last two slides talked about where we are today. Well, let's flash back, go back in time. About six years ago, that's when we decided to open source pretty much all of the drivers required to run Linux on Hyper-V. And this is the, the headline that uh, you know, many of the newspapers and rags published. They said, pigs are flying these days, right? Um, so when we first open sourced all our drivers, they landed uh, in a portion of the kernel tree called the staging area. That's where all new drivers first land. So with the help of uh, the kernel community over the next couple of years, uh, we were able to get it out of the staging area. And today, we have a fairly vibrant community working on Hyper-V as far as various Linux-related issues are concerned. This particular headline is interesting only because it shows how quickly perceptions can change. A couple of years ago, they said, you know, they were quite surprised that Microsoft was even contributing to Linux. A couple of years later, they were wondering why Microsoft was no longer the most active uh, participant in the Linux kernel. The fact of the matter is, the Hyper-V code has gotten to a point where it is quite stable, and the, the, the rate at which we are contributing to the kernel is matching the rate at which we're developing new features, right? And also, initially, back in 2012, I joined Microsoft about five years ago in 2011. In 2012, 2013, pretty much 100% of all the Hyper-V work was done by Microsoft employees, all right? And today, since most distributions have this policy of being a perfect guest, they want 
their version of Linux to run on every platform that's out there. Uh, and Microsoft platforms do account for a significant uh, fraction of, uh, you know, Intel cores that are in use. A lot of these distro vendors are actively working on making sure that Linux on Hyper-V is well maintained and well supported. So today, we at Microsoft only account for about 50% of the patches that are going in. The rest is coming from Red Hat, so the canonical and so on. I'm going to switch gears here a little bit and talk about um, our hypervisor architecture. Right back in, I think early 2000 it was, I guess, um, Microsoft Research at Cambridge funded a project that, sub that subsequently became the Xen hypervisor. So as you can see this um, architecture of Hyper-V, there's a lot of similarity between the way the Hyper-V is structured and the way the Xen architecture is structured. So Hyper-V is a classical type one hypervisor with the hypervisor completely controlling all the hardware. The management head is just another virtual machine that runs on the hypervisor that is privileged in the sense that it's got access to all the hardware. Every other, in Microsoft terminology, each of the virtual machines is called a partition. Right? So there's a parent partition that manages the hardware there are child partitions that could be running different uh, personality kernels. It could be running Windows, it could be running Linux, and so on. And unlike Xen, which initially released a, a version of the hypervisor that supported virtualization where we did not have hardware support for virtualization, Hyper-V requires that the hardware support virtualization. Right. So we do have selective enlightenments. That's the term used by Microsoft to talk about para-virtualization. Right. The I.O. paths, the disk path, the network path, and so on would be selectively virtualized. And what you see there is the VM bus is the, the transport that allows the guests to communicate with the host. And each service, whether it be storage, or networking, or keyboard, or frame buffer, or whatever, each of them will build their own specific protocol on top of VMBus. VMBus just provides you the basic transport, which is a shared memory transport. It also supports all of the signaling optimizations and so on. So for example, in storage, we run the standard SCSI protocol between the guest and the host. The host presents the storage as a SCSI target, and the guest is the initiator. For networking, we run something called remote NDIS. NDIS is the protocol that is used in Windows for driving the network driver. There's a remote version of that. So even though you might be running a Linux guest, as far as the host is concerned, it doesn't know it's a Linux guest. The protocol coming over the wire, I mean, over VM bus, is the remote NDIS protocol. All right, um, as I said, Hyper-V requires um, hardware support for virtualization. That's not an issue today because most hardware that is shipping since almost seven years now uh, has built-in support for virtualization. Um, so we can run any x86 operating system in a fully virtualized fashion. Obviously, the performance won't be good. So we selectively enlighten some of the performance critical uh, paths, like the disk I.O. path or the network I.O. And, and so on. There are also some lower level enlightenments. These are really, in some sense, you know, para virtualizing the kernel itself so that it knows that it's running on a hypervisor. So for example, if you want to do a TLB shootdown, we could do it by acting as if we are running on bare metal and issue an IPI on every CPU and then faulting that and simulating the interprocessor inter from within the hypervisor. Or we could tell the hypervisor, here's the bit mask of all the CPUs whose TLBs I want you to flush. So this is a much more efficient way of uh, doing some of these critical performance, critical operations. So currently we host Linux as a fully virtualized guest, as I said, with selective 
IO enlightenments. Essentially, the, really the two critical performance, critical uh, services are network and disk. Those two, we have specific drivers to uh, speed up that code path. Also, um, especially for the cloud deployments, we wanted to minimize the attack surface, right? So rather than emulating all of the standard devices that the PC architecture is supposed to have, we have what we call the Gen 2 VM, which emulates only a subset of uh, the standard PC hardware. So the firmware we present does not do IDE, it does not emulate uh, the PCI bus, it does not emulate uh, the standard keyboard and you know the, the VGA frame buffer and all that. So in such an environment, we would need to have drivers to deal with the keyboard. It will be para-virtualized paths for the keyboard and video and so on. So th those are the drivers that we currently have in Linux uh, to make uh, Linux run both as a standard guest as well as a, a Gen 2 VM on Hyper-V. All right, with that brief introduction, uh, let's move on to RDMA. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about some of the basic principles of RDMA. Then we can look at uh, how we do guest RDMA on Hyper-V. So as the name suggests, this is direct memory access, and the only difference here is it's DMA through network, all right? So the couple of standards here, InfiniBand is obviously something that's been out there for a while, and then there is IWARP. Rocky is interesting because that is RDMA over Ethernet. I mean, this has been taking, you know, it's been, there's a lot of uptake in Rocky infrastructure these days, and I'll get back to that a little later. As you can see, the, the, the way the, the applications communicate is a little different than the normal read-write system call, where obviously the kernel needs to get involved. Here, the, the applications cooperate initially, set up shared data structures, and the kernel validates that these structures are really uh, within the address space of the communicating applications. And once everything is set up, the data transfer itself can take place without the involvement of the kernel or uh, any software stack. So I'll get a little more into details shortly. So some of the key features of RDMA are obviously zero copy. If you look at a standard you know, network stack, the NIC DMA is into some kernel buffer, and then it gets queued up against a socket. Some point down the road, the, socket you know, the application comes along, does a read, and we transfer data from that kernel buffer to the app buffer. So that's the standard flow of a, a socket-based application. Here there's no copy. The application actually up front tells the system, here is a piece of memory that I would like you to directly DMA stuff into. And so obviously there's no kernel, by, you know, there's no kernel involvement in the data path completely because the application is handing over the buffer to the NIC directly there's no need for the kernel to get involved. And lastly, application has complete control, both in terms of the protocol to be used. I mean, we don't need to run you know, TCP or IP or anything. It is, the application can decide what it is it wants to do. So as I said, the, the way the zero copy works is um, the, the application first, there's a, a setup phase where the two ends of the application running on two different nodes potentially will initially cooperate to tell each other what it is they want to uh, have RDMA into or out of, right? They, they register the memory that's going to be used in this RDMA transaction. At the point of the registration, the kernel actually makes sure that the memory being given is something that belongs to the application that's trying to communicate, so it validates uh, the transaction being initiated. Subsequently, since the DMA could occur when the process is not running, we need to pin the memory down so that as the DMA engine starts moving data into the page, you know, we want to make sure the page is not paged out. So we, we validate the page, we pin the page down, and then the page is given over to the NIC. And the NIC can then directly uh, do the I.O. to that page. 
All right, I think we covered much of what is in this slide, um, the last couple of slides. All right, here's a, a simple workflow of how the RDMA transfers look like. So the, the thread or the context that wants to initiate the I.O. will post what is, it will post a work item. So it's a, a pair of ring buffers is what you have. And the application will say, here is a, a piece of work that I want you to do. And then once the work item is queued up in the ring buffer, it tells the NIC that the work is now ready for you to execute on. That's almost like a tap on the shoulder to the NIC. The NIC will go then uh, and pick up the work, the work element and process that. And when the work is done, the completion of that work element is notified back to the application through a different mechanism. And the app can choose to either poll on that thing. There's a polling mechanism where you can just say, you know, is it now complete? Keep asking the question. And when it is complete, you can start the next action, next transaction. Or you could also have a mode where you tell the NIC, I want to be notified when the completion occurs. So there's both a polling mode as well as an interrupt mode for getting notifications back from the NIC. All right, so I talked about posting work elements. I mean, these, these are all the, the widgets, if you will, or the resources an RDMA-capable NIC will present, something called a queue pair. A queue pair is simply a bunch of, a couple of ring buffers in which you post what are called as work queue elements, wikis. Uh, it is a small data structure that fully describes the work to be done. And clearly, that data structure is very NIC-specific. Every NIC vendor will define the layout of what that work queue element is. And that's the reason when you have an RDMA-capable application, or rather when you want to run an RDMA application, you will end up binding to the NIC-specific library. Right? If you have a Mellanox card on the box, the MLX4 library will be linked against your application so that it knows how to format this WKE. And when the work is complete, the completion request will come back, and they come back through what are called Completion queue, uh, the CQs are the ones that deliver the completion events, okay? And, and let me go back to the previous slide here. So you, you post uh, a work element into the QP, and then you need to notify the NIC that there's now some new work to be done. And that you do by ringing a doorbell. Again, doorbell really is a hardware construct on the NIC, it just so happens that it is presented to the app address space as a memory uh, mapped I.O. It's part of the MMIO space. So there's a special bit there. You tweak the bit. That bit actually is not in memory. That bit is actually in the uh, NICS hardware. So when the application touches the bit, the NIC is woken up. It goes and reads the uh, you know, work element from QP and acts on it. Likewise, when the completion requests come back, Depending upon how you have set it up, it could be based on interrupt or polling, you will be interrupted. So that you can go and see the, you know, the previous work has been completed. All right, talked about the CQ operation already. All right, um, so since the NIC is presenting much of its internal state directly to the application, it's very important that there be boundaries if you want this to be used by multiple applications that may not trust each other on the same node. And that isolation is also provided uh, by the NIC itself. So uh, th these are again doorbell registers or something I talked about earlier, which is the way that the application can actually tell the NIC there is some pending work to be done. Let me get to the protection domains. This is again a construct that every NIC vendor supports, every RDMA capable NIC vendor supports. Protection domain, think of it as a, an address space uh, for the RDMA applications, if you will. So each application will create a protection domain and everything else, whether it's the queue pairs or CQs and so on, are all going to be resolved within the context of a protection domain. 
So that's the isolation model. So you start off an application, it creates a protection domain. And everything else you do is going to be resolved within that protection domain context. So that's the, the unit of isolation that you would have between competing applications on the same box. Now, the NICs themselves will support a large number of protection domain uh, objects, a large number of QPs, a large number of CQs, and doorbell registers. So there is some partitioning that happens so that each of the applications that want it will get a portion of that uh, assigned to that application. All right, so an app can ask for, you know, I need a thousand QPs. And so the, the kernel will decide if it can assign that many QPs to this application. But once assigned, it will be resolved within the context of the protection domain. So that's how we make sure that competing applications don't trample on each other's, uh, you know, uh, abstractions, if you will. All right. Uh, we, so the only point I want to make here is Network Direct is, how many of you have heard about IB Verbs? Okay. IB Verbs. So if you look at the, the Open Fabric Alliance, they have put out a standard in terms of how RDMA is to be done. You will see two different standards, one for everything but Windows and one for Windows, right? And this is the Windows standard. Network Direct is uh, the standard of how we do RDMA on Windows side. Network Direct actually has a much simpler RDMA model than what is available on the Linux side in terms of IB Worlds. Network Direct only allows point-to-point, -point, reliable, connected data services. So a lot of the verbs that you see in IB verbs have no equivalent uh, operation in the Windows land. All right, so this is again something I think we touched upon earlier, which is, you know, how does the app register its memory with the NIC? It's byte granularity. Uh, it's quite expensive to set it up because the kernel has to first go and make sure that the memory you're trying to register is in fact memory that you own and you have the right privileges to be able to pin that memory down. But once done, everything else is going to be much faster afterwards. All right, now, Network Direct is what we use on a standalone Windows box to be able to project RDMA services to uh, applications running on uh, that particular Windows box. What we have done is we have extended that to be able to project RDMA functionality into guests. And that's what Endure is. This is the, I don't know why this is before my time at Microsoft, pretty much everything is enlightened in some sense. I mean, you see enlightened network direct, that's what Endure is. So we wanted near native performance, obviously. Um, even to the guest, not just the host, but to the guest, we wanted near native performance. And especially in a, in a cloud environment, um, security is extremely important, uh, not so much uh, because we don't even trust the clients that are running there. Uh, the tenants are, uh, we don't even know who they are, what they want to do. So SRIOV, which is one way of doing it, was not the right solution for us because SRIOV even today doesn't have the, the right protection model to be able to deploy on cloud. So, and we wanted to maintain complete control on who can talk to whom, right? We got competing uh, customers running their HPC workloads on Azure. They may just land on the same physical nodes. So we want to make sure that the, the containment was complete and also provably contained. These were some of the requirements we had uh, in trying to come up with an architecture for projecting RDMA. So here's the, the way we did that. If you look at the box on the left, you see exactly what, what um, Network Direct does, right? So the application binds to uh, a NIC specific library in user space. That NIC specific library in the Windows world will speak Network Direct. Network Direct is a bunch of uh, verbs, if you will. So the, that library there speaks um, Network Direct verbs, and that goes directly into the hardware driver. 
and it knows what to do with it. That's how the code path works on a native Windows box where we are running uh, an RDM application. Now, the way it got projected to the guests is between the, 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 the client of that, uh, a, a client driver that runs in the guest and the VSP, which is the, the host side of that driver, we just marshal the network direct calls and send it over to the host, right? So when these calls hit the host, the IHV driver, the IHV driver doesn't even know they came from a remote guest. As far as that's concerned, it's just calls coming in, network direct calls are coming in, it lacked on that. That's how we were able to project RDMA functionality into the guest. And so the control plane operations, which is you know, creation of a protection domain, or registering of memory, or creating a QP, or CQ, this, that, another thing, they all came over VMBus, and the host actually went ahead and made sure that you know, it was within the rights of this particular guest to be able to acquire those resources, validated all the stuff, and then once it is set up, the DMA could occur directly from <clears throat> the NIC in the host into memory in the guest. So that's how that worked. That's how it actually is working <clears throat> on Azure today. Excuse me. <clears throat> so here's uh, some of the details of what I just discussed. Right? VHP stands for, for those of you familiar with uh, Xen, there's this front-end, back-end notion. There's a front-end driver and a back-end driver. In Microsoft uh, terminology, we have this VSC, which is the virtual service client, which is the front-end driver. VSP, which is the virtual service provider, which is the back-end driver. So on the host side, VSP implements the resource partitioning on a per-VM basis. So up front, it decides you know, how it's going to divvy up all of the NIC resources across the various VMs that might run on that node. And VSP does the marshalling of messages coming from the guest and handing it over to the, the, the driver, the NIC driver and the host. That's all the VSP does. On the VSC side, the guest side, all it did was it got network direct calls from the application running in the guest. It just forwarded that over to the host just a, you know, pick it up and just send it in, is all that it did. And neither the VSP nor VSC would interpret the IHV specific part of the payload. When you, when you send a, a you know, network direct message, there's a portion of the payload that is really NIC specific. And these guys would not interpret that at all. They just pass it over to the NIC driver because it's only interpreted by the NIC driver. All right, so, so when I, about a couple of years ago, we were already um, deploying uh, Windows RDMA on Azure, and we have a bunch of uh, high-performance computing uh, customers running their HPC workloads on Azure. What we discovered was there was a significant interest in running Linux HPC workloads on Azure. A lot of the HPC workloads today happen to be running on Linux, and so there was quite a bit of interest in making sure that you know, if we could run Linux workloads on Azure, especially the HPC workloads. So I began this work about a little more than a year and a half ago or so, I guess, and I was looking at you know, how could I extend Endure to also support Linux guests within the same model, all right? So here are some of the key requirements that uh, I started with. Number one, obviously, I couldn't make any changes to the host. I mean, that's changing now, but when I got started at Microsoft, you know, the host was really a black box. I couldn't really change much in the host at all. All the changes had to be in the guest. Uh, so no changes in the host, and we want to be able to capture current HPC workloads that are running on Linux. So I couldn't go and make any changes to the Linux user space as well. 
That's a given thing, right? I mean, somebody walks in with, uh, you know, Linux-based HPC workload. I can't ask them to recompile or make any tweaks to the user-level library or the app itself. So that piece is fixed. And so the key challenge was how do you go about bridging these two worlds? On one end, I have this network direct, which is what the host understands. On the guest side, especially on the Linux side, oh, 10 minutes. Um, we have IB Worlds. So let me quickly walk through this now because I have only 10 more minutes left. All right, here's the, the architecture that I came up with for supporting guest RDMA. Essentially, the VSC piece there became not only uh, a forwarding engine that would forward IB Worlds, but it would map IB Worlds to a collection of uh, network direct calls. That's where really the the big challenge was. So the control path is over VM bus, just like uh, in the case of Endure. And once everything is set up, the data path completely bypasses the host kernel, the guest kernel, and the data is directly uh, DMA'd into the guest pages. All right. So as I looked at what IB Verbs required and what, you know, Network Direct supported, these IB web calls had nothing equivalent on the Network Direct side. So I didn't even bother implementing these things. Some of the challenges uh, of implementing Endure for Linux, I've listed them here. As I said, the, the user level couldn't change in Linux. So the way the, the application discovers uh, which particular NIC is available underneath is to go look at the SysFS uh, uh, files to see what the PCI ID and the vendor ID of the NIC is, and based on that, the app will link against that particular uh, NIC-specific library. And so since on Azure we deploy Mellanox cards, I went ahead and made my driver masquerade as a Mellanox ConnectX3 card. So the, the user level thinks that there was a Mellanox card, so the app would bind itself against the Mellanox libraries and then start issuing Mellanox-specific IB web calls. So while some calls mapped nicely, a single IB web call would map onto a collection of network direct calls, not just one. One call here, like connect, for example, I had four calls to make here to the host for this one call, which meant there were some very interesting failure cases to deal with. You know, I do three of these things, fourth one fails. How do I roll back? And how do I keep the state machine of the Linux side in sync with the state machine on the host side? That's the toughest part, right, in the RDMA world to make sure that arbitrary dropping of packets and connections are properly handled. And that really took a lot of effort in making sure that we kept both the state machines in sync. I will quickly, okay, here's the status of where we are today. Uh, we support the uh, Mellanox cards. Uh, I've packaged up this driver as an RPM so it can be loaded up on CentOS and RHEL and SLES uh, kernels. In fact, today on Azure, we have an image, a SLES 12 image, which has already got the RDMA driver baked in. So you can just deploy that and bring over your HPC workloads. I haven't upstreamed the code yet, which I plan to do over the next couple of months. On the host, you could either have InfiniBand as well as Rocky. The guest really doesn't care. As far as the guest is concerned, it is still endure, and so we're able to change the, the infrastructure in the back end without really affecting the, the guests at all. All right. Uh, Here's the first set of numbers. As you look at HPC workloads, the latency is very important, right? I mean, we have, we've got two classes of workloads, one that are embarrassingly parallel. For them, it really doesn't matter what the latency is because you partition the job up, you can form it out. At the end of the day, we can collect the results. And then there are real jobs which tend to talk quite a bit while they're computing. And so if the time you take to com communicate is a bigger fraction of the time you take to compute, you're not going to scale. 
as you throw more cores at the problem. So as you can see here, for small packets, um, we have a couple of microsecond latency, pretty much close to what the bare metal can do. And for larger packets, the through, is the 40, mega, uh, no, 40 gigabit infinite band infrastructure. We do north of uh, 32 gigabits per second throughput. And the, the latency is really very nice, a uh, couple of microsecond latency. This is VM to VM, not, you know, not host to host. VM running on one node to VM running on another node. All right, let me go to, I mean, here's the LS Dyna uh, benchmark. As you can see, as you throw more cores at the problem, the time it takes to do the computation almost linearly goes down. Another LS Dyna run. These numbers were given to me by one of the customers that is experimenting with Azure. I'm not quite sure how you know, VM on Azure can be faster than the bare metal. I need to go back and check with him to see exactly <laughs> how we got these numbers. But the fact of the matter is we are fairly close to bare metal. Uh, very close to bare metal is where we are. So with that, I'll stop, take a few questions, if you have any. Hi, I was just wondering for your current driver implementation, have you tested both pure InfiniBand versus with Rocky like over Ethernet, and how, do, how does the latency and throughput compare for the current driver for those two? InfiniBand is clearly better, um, both on the, at least on the latency side, InfiniBand is better, um, what we meant, right. But Rocky is easy to administer, and that's where I think uh, people are headed. We are experimenting with Rocky right now. We haven't committed to switching it over to Rocky, but we have made sure that the stuff runs on Rocky. Both Windows side as well as Linux side can run on Rocky as well. Can, can you give a, like a, a, you know, a rough percentage comparison on how, 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 what the difference is currently or not? Uh, I don't have the numbers for Rocky, but infinite band numbers I just showed you here now. But you know, if you want, I could send you the numbers. Uh, but they were not as good as infinite band numbers. Any more questions? Um, sorry, I don't know a lot about Azure. I assume it's multi-tenant, right? Like lots of instances. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Um, is there anything in this, like, uh, from the security side? So uh, denial of service seems like an obvious one if you're a malicious container. So, and potentially yeah. getting access to somebody else's, like, some sort of fuzzing, I don't, I don't know how you, what that mechanism would look like, but potentially you could use your driver to look into someone else's stream, right? Well, so the way we deal with that is uh, when you try to connect to something else, when you try to send an R packet out to establish the route, we make sure that you can only talk to those endpoints that are part of your cluster, right? So initially, when you deploy your job, you're going to tell us exactly what nodes belong to you. And it is only those nodes that you can communicate. Uh, at our time, we will filter out uh, connection requests uh, that you're trying to make to somebody else that is not within your. And that's why we didn't want to use the SARIOV. A SARIOV wouldn't give us that level of control. Although these days, we have something called uh, GFT, the generic flow tables. Uh, which allows us to do some additional policy-based filtering of what's going on. But this is pre-GFT is what we did here. Right. So this is what we have today. So that question about uh, denial of service, um, we deal with that in a couple of different ways. Right. One is we make sure you only connect to things that you're allowed to connect to. And then I talked about uh, having this smaller firmware attack surface where you could you know, try to bring down the, the host by just touching some MIO, MMIO space and you know, forcing multiple faults. So we're doing a bunch of things to make sure that uh, you cannot really create noise outside of your VM. What, what if you create a little path? So if you've got a host and you just decide, I'm just going to arbitrarily do a lot of stuff. That, that tenant server is, is like the only container, right? Like it's the only thing that can effectively use that, that host. Sorry, do you mind just quickly repeating that? Sure. Uh, yeah, so uh, at the driver level and like the direct interaction, you, you can mitigate that. But if you've got one tenant on a host that is generating a rubbish workload, 
um, any other person that ends up on that host isn't going to get any advantage. Like to me, I would say like no advantage from from that. Well, it's, you know, some of the really uh, big customers here they want to make sure they run uh, as the only tenant on that piece of hardware. So there we have VM SKUs. For example, there's something called A9. A8 and A9 are the VM types on which we support infinite band backend. So on A9, there's only one VM per node. Right? So these guys actually want to make sure they fully control all the hardware that they want. And the, on A8, we have two VMs going on a node. There, yes. Uh, but even there, too, all you can do is you're going to pay us the money because you're consuming bandwidth and CPU. But we'll make sure that uh, there's costs in place to make sure whatever we're guaranteeing the other VM, we guarantee that level of service. Sure. Any, Anything any else? questions? So when you were talking about the uh, subset of IBVerbs commands that yeah. uh, you weren't kind of able to make work with this, is it? could you do that just because those weren't very commonly used? And the, <laughs> the, That's the, an excellent question. Right now, when I began the work, I wasn't even quite sure it would work. The, these two universes were so, so different. Trying to bring them together with all the constraints I had, I said, OK, I'm, let me start with ARPing. You know, very simple RDMA program. Let me make sure it works first. I got it to work. Then that, that emboldened me to see if I could run an MPI on top of this. And sure enough, Intel MPI has got enough knobs and uh, things to turn off features that I can't support. So the workloads I'm supporting today on Azure are based on Intel MPI. Now, I've been working with IBM guys uh, with their MPI. In fact, we found a bug in their MPI, and now we can support both Intel and IBM's MPI. It, it turns out that not everything in IBWorks is currently in use by many of these commercial MPIs, number one. And number two, keep in mind, though, I don't support in-kernel RDMA. This is just user RDMA. And so many of the IBWorks that you have there, post-receive and post-send, those all you would need only if you want to do kernel RDMA. So it just all worked out uh, rather well, uh, you know, just, uh, I don't know, just worked. And uh, there's considerable commercial interest in running HPC workloads on Azure today. Anyone else? All right. Thank you all. Thank you, KY, for that great presentation. <laughs>